Happy hump day. I was uh, cleaning the counters and I uh, saw my 409, Formula 409 bottle has a label here that says it kills 99.9% .9 of bacteria and viruses. So I thought, oh, let's look at the active ingredients. And here we see the active ingredient is an alkyl C12 40% of carbon chain of 12 and C14 50%, C16 10% dimethyl benzyl ammonium chloride. So it's 0.3% that active ingredient. I guess that's what's killing the uh, bacteria and viruses. And then the other ingredients are 99.7%. <clears throat> so uh, let's see what that's all about. And uh, come with me down my rabbit hole that took way too much of my time up, but it's got good stuff in it. Uh, so, and then we're gonna do the announcements like we're doing now in chapter 17 and then maybe get to 18 enolates. So here's the Formula 409 product ingredients I found online. I went to this website here, the Clorox company. It's mostly water, the solvent, as you might expect. And then it's got laurel amine oxide. Check this out. It's got a long fatty chain, and then it's got some charge up top here, but the charges cancel each other out. This is a uh, called a non-ionic surfactant. And what is a surfactant? A surfactant is a molecule that has a charged, full charge or partial charge, like this has got a full plus, full minus portion to it, and also a nonpolar portion or portions. So this is the nonpolar and that's a surfactant. And this surfactant is non-ionic because look at that, the nitrogen and the oxygen cancel each other out. And it's a Zwitter ionic surfactant, it's another term for it. A Zwitter ion is a molecule that has a positive and negative formal charge that cancel out. So the molecule overall has no charge, but it has formal charges. So a common uh, Zwitter ionic, that's my definition there, Zwitter ions. <clears throat> a neutral molecule, uh, like some amino acids at pH 7, which you saw in the HPLC um, material. So for example, this is the... the common amino acid alanine, this is in your proteins, and it's got the ammonium, which is positively charged when it's at pH 7, and the carboxylate, that's negatively charged at pH 7, so together they cancel out, so the molecule's overall not, not charged, even though it has a positive and a negative charge as a part of it, so that's a Zwitter ion. And it's got the S stereochemistry like we saw in the uh, HPLC stuff, the, most of the amino acids, the common amino acids have the S stereochem. And uh, it, this molecule is primarily a cleaner. Uh, it cl helps clean, like when you spray 409 on the counter, it helps take grease off the counter. Let's see how that works. And, but it's also antimicrobial as well. It's not listed as the active ingredient, but it, uh, it'll also mess up uh, bacteria and things like that. Uh, so let's look at... Laurel, oh, this is actually, oh no, this isn't the active ingredient. No, but this will also kill the bacteria and the virus as well. So laurel amine oxide, let's look into it a little more detail. This is the nonpolar tail, and then this is the polar head. So how does it clean things? Well, nonpolar grease can be washed away with this surfactant. So here's a representative nonpolar component molecule of grease. <clears throat> The nonpolar grease is not very water soluble, as you know, uh, but the surfactant can make a micelle around the grease, which allows it to be washed away. So let me show you what that is. So here's some grease, here's water. Water can't wash away the grease alone very well because water's polar, grease is nonpolar. But you add a surfactant, and the surfactant makes this ball. I'm just showing it as a, like a cross section of it, but it's a three dimensional ball with all of its nonpolar tails pointing to the inside of the ball, and then its charge portions on the outside so the water can uh, bond to it, hydrogen bond to it. And the grease will go into the center of this micelle ball, and it'll be dissolved because it's nonpolar and like dissolves light. And then the outside with the water <coughs> can now be, this, this grease can be washed away in the micelle, a little bead of like fat in the water. So that's how soaps and detergents work. So here's an extreme close-up of it. So we've got our cross-section of our micelle, nonpolar tails on the outside, the uh, charged portions outside. And so the grease can dissolve in there, and then on the outside you can have water molecules bonded, hydrogen bonding to all these all the way around to help wash it away, clean it off the counter. And uh, let's talk about surfactants actually, other surfactants too, it's pretty interesting stuff. 
So they, you usually talk about surfactants in three different ways, with the hydrophil end, the, you know, the charged end, and then the hydrophobic end, hydrophobe. So the head can be non-ionic like this, uh, but it will have partial charges. Like this can be, say, an alcohol, a hydrogen with a delta plus and the oxygen with a negative. Or it could be, and then it would have, of course, a nonpolar tail. Uh, or the head can be anionic with a negative charge, <clears throat> and a nonpolar tail, they always have nonpolar tails. And then it could be cationic, nonpolar tail. Or it can be zwitterionic, non-ionic, because it has charge, full charges, not partial charges, but it's overall neutral. And then a nonpolar tail. So let's look at some examples of these guys. So laurel amine oxide, we saw that one, that's in 409. It's nonpolar, non-ionic, zwitterionic, formula 409. What about this one here? Well, how would you classify sodium stearate? This is uh, the most used and historically ever used soap. This is what bar soap's made out of. And it's been made out of, like, some people trace it back to the Babylonians like thousands of years ago. So uh, what about this guy? It's got the nonpolar tail. What's this end, the head, the polar head? It's anionic. It's got the negative charge. <clears throat> so this is bar soap. And this could be made from saponified triglycerides. So remember when we did biodiesel synthesis, we took the triglycerides and we added methoxide. If instead of methoxide, you add hydroxide, you get these. It's just saponification. And then I found some other ones. This one's an interesting one. This one, it's got the nonpolar tail and a cationic head. See now instead of an anion, cation, but still works. And it's in topical, it's, it's in topical antiseptics, shampoos, and cosmetics. And then we've got the laurel glucoside. This one's an interesting one, nonpolar tail, 12 carbons here. And uh, it's non-ionic, but it's got alcohol. So it's got a delta minus, delta plus, delta minus, delta plus. So it's got polarity due to hydrogen bonding there, right? And this is in baby shampoo. <clears throat> this is a common, this is in the uh, Johnson & Johnson's uh, No More Tears baby shampoo. It's milder shampoo because it doesn't have a full-on charge like the normal bar soap. It's just got partial charges. And it's made from uh, cornstarch. This is glucose right here from cornstarch. And uh, the, the hydrocarbon chains from coconut fat. So you can saponify or you can uh, reduce the triglycerides in coconut fat to get the alcohols in an atom on here. And then we got a couple more and we'll be done with these. So fact, a relative... Uh, representative alkyl benzene sulfonate. This has got the nonpolar tail like branched area and uh, it's anionic. It's a sulfate. Look at that. It's like um, you deprotonated a sulfonic acid. You can see when they make this molecule, they actually put the alkyl chain on first and that's an orthopara director and they sulfonate and then they just deprotonate the sulfonic acid. And this is in tied pods, not breath mints. So there was controversy there for a while. Kids and other people were eating Tide Pods and they can kill you so you don't want to eat them. But since then they've uh, added a bitter ingredient to it so if you do happen to taste it, it tastes really bitter and bad and hopefully spit it out. And then they no longer have clear containers because it looks sort of like a candy jar. They've made it so you can't see into it uh, if, it's, you know, if it helps. Uh, and then we got another one here. We got a disodium alkyl phosphate ester. So this one's got the nonpolar tail, and what is it here? It's anionic. And this can be used in dry cleaning, like when you bring your clothes to the cleaners. And one more, dimethyl dioctyl ammonium chloride. It's a, got two nonpolar tails, and it's a cationic. And this one is a, was a major component of fabric softeners. But it's been replaced with more biodegradable substitutes. This one took a while to break down in nature, so they found some other ones for the different uh, fabric softeners. And now, continuing on, uh, we didn't even get to the active ingredient yet. This is the active ingredient. Remember, it had the Seq 12, 14, 16. And as from our ingredients here, here it is. It's a benzyl ammonium chloride with a what could be... When n equals 1, this is 12 long, see it's 12 carbons, see 12, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, that's 40% of it uh, when it's 12 carbons long. If you make n equal 3, then you've got 14 carbons long, that's 50% of it, and then when n equals 5, it's 16 carbons long. 
I don't know that the length of that makes that much of a difference, but that's what it's listed as, so that's what it is. And then um, it's an active ingredient and in, listed in 409. It's antimicrobial. And, and it's also a cleaning agent because you could tell it's also a surfactant, nonpolar tail. It can make a micelle. And this guy, uh, it can break apart cell membranes of bacteria, viruses, and humans as well. So you can't like drink it, but it's okay to have it on your hands a little bit. Uh, and the, but the bacteria and the viruses, they when they get exposed to it, it 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 breaks open their cell walls and they can leak out the insides of them, their proteins and things, and kill them. Uh, so it's used in eye and nasal drops uh, as a preservative. It's used in hand sanitizers, wound washes like Bactine, throat lozenges, and spermicide creams too. It kills our sperm. It affects the cell membranes of the sperm. <clears throat> and then, uh, so let's see how that works. So this is a lipid bilayer. This is, can be the cell membrane of our cells, viruses, bacteria. And so the blue part is the phospholipid head, which can be positive or just polar, or uh, uh, it can be negative as well if that's not attached. So you have this charged blue head that's on the outside of the cell, and then you have the nonpolar inside of the cell wall, which are these long hydrocarbon chains, and then on the further inside you have the charged heads again. So this is our lipid bilayer. And can you see how this uh, formula 409 loramine oxide, uh, this, I should actually have the other dude here, huh? Well, this would work too, but I should be having this. Yeah, that's the one I want, huh? That was dumb. That guy actually will, it is antimicrobial too, but this is listed as the active ingredient, so let's put this guy there. This is the... Uh, all right, yeah, so that's the active ingredient. You can see how this could uh, damage the cell because then the, the nonpolar part can go into the middle. This can go into the hydrophobic side and then just kind of like start to screw it all up and break it apart and then inside of the cell can leach out. All right, so we got that one. Do, do, do. And then now there's more stuff. There's uh, these anti-foam components like this polydimethylsiloxane silica polyethylene glycol, diesterates. And so there's a, these are all defoamers. They're part of it. Like when you spray it, it doesn't foam up too much. And this happens to be what's in our GCMS, our stationary phase, the polydimethylsiloxane. It's interesting. And then there's ethanolamine. It's a common solvent and cleaner polar molecule. And then there's fragrances to mask the unpleasant unple flavors or smells, that, you know, unpleasant odors that might be present. It's a mixture of essential oils and aroma compounds. And then they got some colors to this. They got this uh, li liquidant bright yellow dye, and it's to improve the aesthetic appeal of it. And also it could be like a tracer, like these can be used in things like toilet bowl cleaners so you could see where you've sprayed it. And uh, so tar tar tartrazine is, uh, I believe that's the main yellow component dye in this. And um, it, it has a lot of aromaticity, huh? It's got this aromatic ring that can conjugate to the nitrogens, and to this aromatic ring, to that. So you can see a lot of conjugation, and that's what gives it the color. It makes its highest occupied molecular orbital and its lowest unoccupied molecular orbital close enough together to where their energy gap corresponds to a yellow color. And then it also has a blue dye in there. Same sort of thing, and I believe it's indigo dye that also gives it the that gives this the blue color. It's got a benzene ring, and you can see how it's conjugated all the way through. And then it has tetra potassium ethyl, I think it's ethylene, I think I might have typed it wrong, diamine tetraacetic acid, or EDTA. Some of you who took Chem 5 probably heard of this. This helps remove soap, uh, soap scum and hard water scale. And uh, it's actually in a lot of things. It's a preservative as well. The EDTA is pretty cool. So it's ethylene, it's got the two carbons, ethane, two amines, and each amine has two carboxylates or carboxylic acids if they're protonated. So it's really amazingly good at binding metals. We'll see how calcium, magnesium, iron. You can actually use it to titrate almost every element on the periodic table because it's so good at grabbing things. So here it is drawn again, close up, and it's drawn in its form that it binds to metals. 
So let's go ahead and talk about this. It's a hexadentate ligand. So what does that mean? Let's say we have a metal in here. This could be calcium or magnesium. It can be bound, <clears throat> that, cal that metal can be bound by six teeth. That's what dentate refers to, like a dentist, hexadentate. So it can be bound by that oxygen, that one, that one, that one, and then the two nitrogens too. And it gets bound in an octahedral metal complex like that. So it holds on really tight. So if it grabs onto the calcium of, oh, crud, I hate it. Yeah, there we go. All right, so uh, if you bind the calcium, say, on hard water scum, then you'll uh, allow the rest of the molecule to wash away. And if you bind, say, metals in food, then that metal can't catalyze the oxidation of the food, so it's a preservative. Um, all right, and then, yeah, whew, that was a long rabbit hole. So I'm going to come out of the rabbit hole. Hope you guys enjoyed it. I'm out of the rabbit hole. Let's get some stuff going. So uh, I'll get back to you about the total synthesis, like I said. Lab exam next week. I will provide you with the lab exam guide tomorrow. I don't have it today. <clears throat> well, maybe later today, actually, because it's actually it's Tuesday night right now for me. But you'll be seeing this tomorrow. Exam corrections will be today and tomorrow for you guys in your time space continuum. Uh, so I'll email you your quiz, uh, your after exam quiz. And do me a favor, please email back saying you got it. That'll really help me see, and this will be good practice for us for the rest of the exams and things. So whenever I send you a quiz or an exam, just email back, got it. And can you email it back just to me, not to the group? That'll help me out a lot. <clears throat> all right, so you might get a question different than your exam, so check the key and look at all the answer, answers that are on there. Do you want to take it tomorrow, Wednesday, instead of Thursday? If you're in a Thursday lab, just let me know. Email me. And turn in stuff, uh, come to the Zoom sessions, do that mandatory England extra credit if you haven't already. Uh, I've talked about the experiments that we, we have all the data available for you. You should be able to do all these. And uh, a new one just came in, Aldehyde Enigma. I just put that data up and uh, you can do that now. <clears throat> and we're going to have some fun. Uh, the... I know it's hard when you're at home all day staring at your computer, sitting at your desk, so I wanted to do something cool. We're going to make an epic retrosynthesis, and then we're going to each take part in answering it by throwing a paper airplane across the county lines from like Rockland to Roseville to Auburn to Grass Valley to Citrus Heights, wherever you live. I want you all to take part. So far, I've got these people confirmed. Uh, Nishida hasn't confirmed but Sam confirmed for her and uh, Ryan uh, McCallum, McCallum I'm softly he's a uh, he's gonna do he's gonna do the music for it actually the background music and the opening credits is gonna be actually performed by Mo Freezy with Z to the eight to the ch rapping over and be creative with it have fun with it and I'll show you what I mean about this stuff too here uh, in just a second. Yeah, I'm actually going to show you a video of me, the beginning part. All right, I'm going crazy in the garage here. I'm thinking I got to send out an epic retro. So let me uh, first put my, uh, my mask on my maid on. Make sure I put it on the right way. into the paper airplane, send it on its way. Make sure we sterilize it first, form of the 409. And off she goes. Wait, is that it? Oh, it's coming. 
Oh, look at that. Let's see how they did. Here's a little bit of review and warm up for today's lecture. So we learned at the end of the last lecture that you could take a, uh, acetophenone right here, uh, an, a benzene ring with a ketone attached to it, and um, take it from being, what is it, an ortho or a meta direct, ortho paradirector or a meta director? It is a meta director, you can see, because there's no lone pair here, it can resonate out. If you treat this with zinc amalgam, HCl, heat, you can reduce that carbonyl completely away, just the alkyl chain. And now, this is no longer a meta director, it's an ortho paradirector. So that was a meta director, deactivator, ortho paradirector, weak activator. And you can reverse this if you have an alkyl chain. You can uh, take this alkyl chain, which is an ortho paradirector, weak activator, and you can treat it with Jones oxidation like we did with primary alcohols to uh, carboxylic acids, and you can get that carbonyl right back. And that's now a meta director. So you can go back and forth on these. Um, I'm going to be giving you these four reactions on the exam, like I gave you the periodic table, so you don't have to memorize these ones. And then if you have a nitro group and you, you can reduce it as well, you add the same. I made it, there's different ways to do this, but I made it the same, so it's like it's easy to remember. Oh, I guess I gave you both, or HCl and, and iron. But uh, HCl and zinc amalgam will also reduce this, but in, under the acidic conditions, it will have the amine protonated so you can add sodium bicarbon. Take it from a meta director to an ortho pair director and it'll have it won't be protonated because of the and then once you have the meta or ortho pair director here you can oxidize that to make it a meta director of the nitro group. So you can go back and forth on these. And um, I wanted to we're gonna talk a lot about this strong and weak things and will they react. So if you look at carbonyl like a ketone is it a strong electrophile or a weak electrophile it's actually a weak electrophile it, it's electrophilic at the carbonyl carbon but not super electrophilic and water as far as it being a nucleophile is it strong or weak it's a weak nucleophile so do you think a weak nucleophile is going to react with a, a weak electrophile no what about this one i've got my weak electrophile again my ketone but my hydroxide what is that strong or weak strong nucleophile so it will, uh, will they react? Yeah, as long as one's strong. And then here, um, if you protonate the ketone, how would that affect the charge on this carbon? Well, this carbon is positively charged here because oxygen's more electronegative, but when the oxygen has a plus charge after it's protonated, it's even more electronegative, so it's really gonna pull electrons towards it. So this carbon's gonna be much more positive when it's protonated than when it's not. So now we say that's a strong electrophile, and so will a weak electrophile, weak nucleophile react with that? Yes. So you need at least one strong. Two weak, don't react. Strong nucleophile, weak electrophile reacts, and a strong electrophile, weak nucleophile reacts. And then here's a little review of PCC because we're gonna do this MnO2 reaction, yes, next, manganese four oxide oxidations. So remember PCC, that takes just one hydrogen. So it can take, oh, tertiary hydrogen, alcohol has no hydrogen, so no reaction there. And then this is the second, uh, well, I'm not going this way, sorry. Uh, we have a methanol. Uh, it has three hydrogens. It takes one of them. So you have two left. It makes meth, uh, formaldehyde. This one has two hydrogens, takes one of them, and now you have an aldehyde. This only has one hydrogen off it. Take one of them, and you have a ketone. Let's see what happens with this manganese 4 oxide. I've got uh, a, meth a methoxy group here that's not an alcohol, but I got an alcohol here. It has a hydrogen off it, a secondary alcohol, another secondary alcohol, and a tertiary alcohol. So right off the bat, do you think the tertiary alcohol is going to react? Hopefully not. It doesn't react. Uh, but these secondary ones, let's see which ones of those reacts. Ooh, just this one. So this Mn... O2 is selective, huh? It's just reacting with that one. Well, how's this alcohol different from that alcohol? Well, I guess this is dash and that's wiggle, but I don't think it's that. Oh, wait, this one's right next to the alkene. This is an allylic alcohol, huh? That's the reason why. Manganese 4 oxide is specific for allylic alcohols. So we'll talk more about that on the whiteboard now. So we have a nice example here for the... MnO2 oxidation. 
and we'll review the PCC oxidation and the Jones oxidation, see how they're different. Um, so first let's talk about our alcohols. What kind of alcohol do we have here? Is that a primary, secondary, tertiary, or methyl? That's a primary alcohol. And then this next one, what is it? Primary, secondary, tertiary, methyl. That one's secondary. And then this last one is secondary as well. And uh, <clears throat> there is one other thing though that we should note. This one in the middle is special. It's allylic. It's right next to the alkene. The alkene carbons, remember, we call these vinyl. So that's vinyl, that's vinyl, that's allylic. Vinyl, vinyl, that's a. Oh, there, this one's allylic as well. I got two allylic carbons. Is this one allylic? No, because it's vinyl, vinyl, allylic, not. Nah, it's too far away. So let's see what happens with these guys. So the, for the PCC reaction, remember, it only takes one hydrogen. I've got two hydrogens here, but it's only going to take one of those. So it's going to make for me the aldehyde out of that primary carbon right there. The secondary carbon alcohol has a one hydrogen. It's only going to take one, so it'll take that one. So I'll get a ketone there. And that last one, it'll also take just one hydrogen, so I'll get two ketones. So with the Jones oxid, I mean, with the PCC, I'll get an aldehyde and two ketones. What about the Jones oxidation? How's that different? The way it's different is it'll take the primary alcohol First make it into the aldehyde, but not stop there. It'll keep going, it'll rip off that hydrogen too. So this one will make us the, not an aldehyde, but a carboxylic acid. And then the secondary alcohols will also get oxidized to ketones. PCC for primary makes the aldehyde. Jones primary makes the carboxylic acid. And finally, our new one. This is our first really specific reaction. No, I guess not. I guess we use big bases and little bases in E2 to be specific. But this one's really interesting. It chooses just the allylic ones. And it, it oxidizes like PCC. It only takes one hydrogen. So what we wind up with for this guy is the aldehyde on the end like PCC did because that alcohol is primary and allylic, it reacts. Then the secondary allylic will also react because it's allylic, it's gotta be allylic. And the final alcohol, that secondary but not allylic, does not react. So you wind up with just the, with, with one aldehyde, one ketone, and an alcohol that's unreacted. I'm not requiring you to know the mechanism for the uh, manganese four oxide uh, allylic alcohol um, oxidations but if you're curious you can check out our mechanism database we got it in here got a lot of good stuff in here actually actually before we go look at this vocabulary by Victoria Pierce this is a good one she she was saying that she thought sometimes she would get confused with the things we say a lot like a hydride some of it's pretty basic but and then aniline we refer to that we're going to learn about it means to this chapter and enamines, nitriles. So if you want, check it out, cyanohydrins, enols. Uh, that's a nice reference. And then there's a lot of acetal deprotection. We'll be talking about that soon. The synthesis by Virginia. Uh, the do's and don'ts, that's a really good one. I'll probably show you what that one beginning of next lecture. But here's a, oh, manganese allylic oxidation. Here it is. So this one's by uh, Mohammed. Back in, what year was this? I don't have it on here. A couple years ago, a few years ago maybe. But uh, so you can see an allylic alcohol gets oxidized, primary alcohol, to the aldehyde. Up above he's got primary allylic, secondary allylic, and just secondary. This is pretty much like the one I just did on the board. The secondary allylic does not react, but the primary allylics do. Primary and secondary allylic. All right, and he has the curved arrow mechanism. So check it out. See, it's pretty interesting. And uh, see if you agree with it. Back in our uh, 
chapter alkums. We did the manganese 4 oxide oxidations. Now we're going to make you, those of you who are really good at curved arrow mechanisms, even better. We're going to be seeing um, a lot of the concepts we've been talking about before being really used a lot and it's going to help you guys out a lot. You're going to benefit a lot from all your hard work before. So we're going to first look at uh, mechanisms that are under acidic or basic conditions with carbonyls. And so under acidic conditions, uh, we'll see, I'll do some examples on the whiteboard. You want to protonate first usually. We've been saying this all along. If you have a strong acid, it wants to protonate. And you'll have positive charged organic intermediates. Usually they'll have a weak nucleophile because strong nucleophiles, well not always, but usually there are things like hydroxides and they're basic so they wouldn't be in acidic solutions. And uh, and you, you'll have strong electrophiles, a lot of times it'll require you to protonate the carbonyl to make it strong. And then under basic conditions, it's kind of the opposite. Now, in this case, you usually have a strong nucleophile, and you have negative charged organic intermediates, and the nucleophile can just attack even weak electrophiles. And then um, the electrophiles, uh, we have weak elect electrophiles usually and strong nucleophiles. And so we're going to use these concepts to look at the mechanism of the hydration of a carbonyl um, and under acidic and base conditions and you'll see that that makes geminal diols, diols, two alcohols on the same carbon and the equilibrium is really favored usually the carbonyl side but it's still part of the PCC mechanism. This is why Jones oxidation makes carboxylic acids out of primary alcohols but PCC doesn't. And then we're going to look at one of my favorites, the, p -p the p -p 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 -pad peed is this papad P? Yeah, mechanism to make acetals and, and ketals. So uh, let's get back to the whiteboard. Okay, let's look at the uh, formation of a, the reaction equilibrium between a ketone and its hydrate. So here we have a ketone and this is the hydrate. The hydrate is in equilibrium with the ketone, but there's very little of it. It'll be like 99.99% or so of the ketone and very little of the hydrate, but enough in there that we're going to see it's important in reactions. And this is a good mechanism to look at to help you understand my concepts. I was talking about how under acidic conditions it can, should react a certain way. And then we're going to look at an aldehyde making its hydrate under basic conditions. And now, this ketone could also be in equilibrium under basic conditions. I just chose one to be acid, one to be base randomly. Um, so wait, why, why is the term hydrate there? Let's look at the formula for this guy. This is acetone. It's C3H6O, whereas this molecule is C3H678. O2, if you add that up, that's C3H6O plus H2O, right? It's just added water. So I call it a hydrate. Let's do the mechanism. So let's start off by drawing our ketone. The ketone is going to react as eventually an electrophile because it's got to add something to its carbonyl carbon. So this ketone is a weak, is it a weak or a strong electrophile? This is a weak electrophile. And then do we have any strong nucleophiles around? Nope. All we really have is water, which is a weak nucleophile. So will they react as they are now? Will the weak nucleophile be strong enough to add to the weak electrophile? Nope. So we have to do something else first. Oh, we're under acidic conditions. So what usually happens first under acidic conditions? You protonate things. So I've got the hydronium here. It's going to protonate something. What's it going to protonate? The carbonyl oxygen.
And when it protonates it, it's going to change its reactivity a lot. Now, with that oxygen having a positive charge, what happens to the carbon, that, uh, the carbonyl carbon? Before, that carbonyl carbon had a little bit of positive charge to it, delta positive. Now it's got a lot more. It's much more positive there, so we know positive charge is the sign of an acid and electrophile. So now this is a strong electrophile. So it was a weak electrophile, now it's a strong electrophile, and our water is a weak nucleophile, but strong enough now to add to the strong electrophile. So now we can get our addition to the carbonyl, and that gives us the one OH we need, and a protonated OH. We're almost there, huh? To our hydrate. Just about there. And what's the final step we need to do? Just deprotonate. So, water can do that. And remember, we're under acidic conditions, so what kind of charged organic intermediates do we want? We want either no charge or positive charge. So we got positive charge organic intermediate, that looks good under acidic conditions, think positive. And then we have another positive charge organic intermediate, that looks good under acidic conditions. So, and then we're just gonna deprotonate this. Initially, some of my students make a mistake. They're like, oh, I'm gonna deprotonate that, I'll add hydroxide. Should you use hydroxide here? No, because there's not much hydroxide in an acidic solution. The concentration of hydroxide is like 1 times 10 to the negative 12 or something. There's very, very little hydroxide, so water is going to be your base. And here we go. We've got our mechanism for our hydrate. Under acidic conditions. And the uh, hydronium is reformed. So the reaction is catalytic in that. And um, even though I'm showing the equilibrium arrows to get here, these are heavily favored to this side, 99.99%. And it, a good thing for you to do, a doyo, to make you even better at curved arrow mechanisms, is the reverse mechanism. It shouldn't be hard for you. You should see, oh, I've got to get one of these alcohols off. They're bad leaving groups. I'm under acidic conditions. What do I do? Oh, I protonate one of the alcohols. And then when you get to this point, to go back, you've got a good leaving group, a lone pair. That's a push-pull. Drop that down, kick it off, you're here. And then when I mean, you want to get rid of that, the water would just deprotonate it, bring it back there. So that'd be a good practice to do that backwards. And then uh, over here, we're going to do an aldehyde hydrate reaction. And once again, it'll, the equilibrium lies heavily over here. And just barely any of the hydrate is formed. Okay, so let's uh, do this mechanism. So under basic conditions, it's going to be different than under acidic in that we're not going to uh, expect positive charge organic intermediates. We'll expect negative. And we will see something else different. Let's draw up our, what we got here. We've got the aldehyde. The aldehyde has a partial positive charge on the carbonyl. So do you expect that aldehyde to be a strong nucleophile or a weak, nu uh, not nucleophile, strong electrophile or a weak electrophile? It turns out it's weak, just like the ketone. It's actually a little bit stronger electrophile than the ketone because this hydrogen is a little more electronegative, I believe, than the sp3 carbon. So the sp3 carbon donates more negative charge. This is a little less positive than that guy, but still they're both considered weak. All right, so what about our nucleophile? Do we have a strong nucleophile around? We do. 
the hydroxide is a strong nuclear bond. It's got the O minus to it. So do we uh, need to protonate the carbonyl like we did over here to make it a stronger electrophile? Or are we good enough? We've got one strong, we're good enough. And it wouldn't make sense to protonate the carbonyl because you need a strong acid, but we're under basic conditions. So what happens? Strong nucleophile comes in, adds to the carbonyl. And it does create a stereocenter initially. Like that. And uh, we're almost to our final product, right? So I'm guessing you guys already know the answer to the rest of the mechanism. Next up, we'll just uh, protonate the alpha oxide. So when we want to protonate this, what kind of acid do we have around? Should I throw in a hydronium? No, because we're under basic conditions. The hydronium concentration is ultra low. So instead, we're going to use water. So the alkoxide will deprotonate the water to make our hydrate. And interestingly enough, now that I protonated that, it's no longer a uh, stair center. No more wiggle on that guy. And I regenerated my hydroxide, huh? So the hydroxide was catalytic as well. Like the hydronium was on this side. And uh, what else am I gonna ask you to do with this? Do you the reverse? So we can talk about it. How do we do this? Um, deprotonate one, or deprotonate this side, don't matter. And then um, have the, it's not a great leaving group. I would have the hydroxide pop off here. I'll show you that stuff. Uh, let me do it in a different color. So, I like to do this. You've seen me do this stuff before. If I'm going to drop this down and I'm going to have this come off, I'm going to have it be protonated as it comes off. So instead of getting hydroxide as my leaving group, I get a water molecule and a hydroxide. I know it's cheating, but it's the way I like you to do it. Okay, so practice that. Now for a trip down memory lane, remember when we first learned way back in chapter... Learned about oxidations and reductions. This is a big one. Was this chapter eight? Yeah, chapter eight. We learned about Jones oxidation. And if I get to it, you'll see with Jones oxidation, you could take a primary alcohol and it gets oxidized by the chromate to the aldehyde initially, and then that aldehyde under the acidic aqueous conditions that Jones reagent involves, it uh, creates the hydrate. Now, 99% of the, 99.99% of the equilibrium will lie on the aldehyde side, and only you know, a fraction of a percent is a hydrate, but once this hydrate forms, the chromate can oxidize it again to the carboxylic acid, and then it gets stuck there, it doesn't go back. So the, the less than 1% of this that forms gets pulled to the carboxylic acid side and stuck there, and then more of it gets pulled, and you keep pulling the aldehyde. So it's a this step pulls the whole reaction through by Le Chatelier's principle. So that's why if you have a primary alcohol with two hydrogens, Jones oxidation takes them both off. It takes the first one off to make the aldehyde. The aldehyde hydrate forms a hydrate, which then now it can take off the next one. Um, but with PCC, if you remember, that's pyridinium chlorochromate. P pyridinium chlorochromate. That, we don't have water. That's the key, no water. We use methylene chloride as a solvent, and that's a pretty dry organic solvent. And since there's no water, 
If you start with the primary alcohol, it'll get oxidized to the aldehyde by the chloral chromate, but there's no water around to make the hydrate, so it can't go any further to the acid, so it just gets stuck at the aldehyde. So that's why PCC just takes one hydrogen from a primary alcohol and one from a secondary alcohol. Okay, time for our papad peed mechanism. So, let's talk about this reaction first. So, this on this side, on the reaction side, what kind of a molecule is this? What functional group is that? That is a ketone, right? And then on the product side, well, before we get to that, we are going to use ethanol, and you can see two ethanols are added to the ketone, and toxic acid. You've seen toxic acid before, we're going to see it a lot more. It's a, it's, it's a toluene ring, a benzene ring with a methyl, and then a sulfonic acid. You, you know how to make this now, huh? Would you put on the methyl first, or the, sul the sulfonic acid first? If you were starting with benzene. The methyl is an ortho para director, the sulfonic acid is a meta director. You put on the methyl first, and then the sulfonic acid. Okay, and the product over here is uh, referred to in the old nomenclature, it would be called a ketal. Ketal, because it came from a ketone. And uh, if it was an if it came from an aldehyde, let's say I had this. And I did the same thing. This would be called an acetal because, because it came from an aldehyde. So, uh, and for some reason, the old chemists got together at IUPAC and they said, oh, let's just call them all acetals. So if you call this an acetal or a ketal, don't matter to me. Um, all right, so let's look at the curved arrow mechanism of this. So we'll start off, and we'll notice that this uh, ketone is a weak or a strong electrophile. It's going to be an electrophile. We're going to add to it. Is it weak or strong? It's a weak electrophile. Okay, so if it's weak, will it react with any nucleophiles? Does the toxic acid seem like a, a nucleophile? No. Acids and electrophiles are cousins, they're kind of the same. And uh, bases and nucleophiles are similar. But so this is going to be our nucleophile, the ethanol. You can see it added in there. So is the ethanol a strong or a weak nucleophile? It's a weak. And I forgot, I was going to say this before I get started. Remember, as we're going through things like this, well, this is the first time, so maybe not now, but we're going through things, pause the video, do it yourself. Actually, on this example, after I've worked it all out, you should pause the video, <clears throat> try to work it all out on your own, and then check the answer against the video. <clears throat> all right, so we got a weak electrophile, a weak nucleophile. Will they react? Weak and weak? No. So what do we need to do? We need to protonate this guy to make it a stronger electrophile. Toxic acid's a pretty strong acid. <clears throat> I think a pK about minus two. Uh, so this actually, I don't think this is a very product favored reaction, but enough of it will happen to get things going. So we protonate the ketone and uh, make that ketone into a strong Electrophile. And now the toxic. Oh, you know what though? Shoot. Cut, cut, cut. <laughs> Instead of having the toxic acid protonate the ketone, which it can do. I want to draw what I think happens most. I think what happens most is the toxic acid protonates the ethanol, which is the solvent as well. Just like when we have a bottle of hydrochloric acid, I say it's really hydronium and chloride. I want to protonate the ethanol with the toxic acid. Just 
start things off. Uh, this is kind of one of my things that I like. I don't know if you'll see this by other people online that much, but follow along with me and it'll help you out, I think. So I like the, the, uh, this mechanism we're going to do. This will be your longest mechanism you've learned so far. We're going to start doing some long ones and you're going to get good at it. And there's a uh, mnemonic for this. Uh, it's the uh, pad this will help you with the mechanism. The way it'll help you is you'll see the first step of the mechanism is a protonation. P. So the ethanol is being protonated by uh, tosic acid. And now what's the next step of the mechanism? Another protonation. Drop there again. And that's where I then take and make my weak Electrophile stronger. So now, after that protonation of the solvent, protonation of the ketone, I have a strong electrophile. And ethanol is a weak nucleophile, but that's okay because it's a strong electrophile. So now my ethanol can act. And, and when I say add, there it is from the papad, huh? We're going to add the carbonyl. Okay, we're getting there. We're gonna, we want to get to make our ketal, aka acetal. We want two ethanols where that carbonyl carbon was. And so far we have an alcohol on one side. Oh, oh alcohol on one side, yeah. And then the protonated ethanol. What do you think should happen next? I want this guy to stay on there. And right now it's a good leaving group. But I don't want it to leave. I mean, it can. This reaction is reversible. What about our alcohol here? What kind of a leaving group is that? That's a bad leaving group. Bad. So what do I need to do? I don't want this to be good anymore. My mnemonic says protonate, protonate, add. And then what do you think the D is? Deprotonate. Yeah. I'm going to deprotonate this good leaving group because I don't want it to be a good leaving group. So that's what I do. Uh, what should I deprotonate with? Should I use the toss, tosic acids conjugate base, the toslate? No, that's a really weak base. I'll just use the ethanol. And you're going to think of the ethanol. The ethanol plays two roles here. It's our nucleophile and it's our what we call proton shuttle. going to shuttle protons around. So it's going to come over here, deprotonate our good leaving group. To give us the ethanol on there. And uh, it regenerates the acidic protonated ethanol like that. And now at this point, I've got two bad leaving groups, huh? That's a bad leaving group, and that's a bad leaving group. But I want the alcohol to leave, don't I? Because I don't have any alcohols on here at the end. So what do I need to do to that alcohol to make it a good leaving group? Let's see. The pad. P. Oh, protonated. Yeah. So all I need to do is have the proton shuttle come over here and protonate that. Are you liking the, the pad P mnemonic?
There we go. And the ethanol is regenerated. Okay, so now I had a bad, le bad leaving group. Bad to a good leaving group. Okay, so I got a good leaving group. Um, <clears throat> what's my next step in my thing? I just did the. Oh, I got an E. What's E? That's a new one. Can I buy a vowel? So E is eliminate. So I'm going to eliminate the water now. And how's that going to happen? Well, this is a good leaving group. It wants to leave, boom, like that, right? Should I have uh, the ethanol come and kick it off SN2 style? It's kind of crowded for an SN2 there, isn't it? It's tertiary. And also, I think this ethanol nucleophile is being way outcompeted by the lone pair that's already on the molecule. It just can drop down a lone pair like that. That's the way I like to draw this mechanism, and I want you to as well. And that's there is our elimination. And uh, there's another term for this I want us to know, which you've heard before. This is a push pull step. So it's a, sorry, my board is just small. It's a push pull mechanism. So I've got the lone pair on the ethanol pushing the water off, and the water with its positive charge is pulling electrons towards it to get rid of its positive charge. So push pull. In this elimination step, and we get to here. And our water comes off. Oh, you know what I forgot to say initially, too? Okay, in our overall reaction, we're going to remove water here as well. If you remove water from this reaction, it drives the equilibrium towards the Ketal, aka acetal or acetal. <clears throat> we'll start talking actually about methods to remove the water too. You can already know one of them. Like for example, if you threw some sodium sulfate in the reaction, it would hydrate the water that forms. I would remove it. <clears throat> okay, so I've got this guy and I know my board's running out of room. I'm gonna redraw it. So let's go over here. The water that's being removed, and then this here, it's only still got one ethanol on it. How am I going to think of that guy? What kind of reactivity does it look like it has? Does it look like an acid, a base, an electrophile, a nucleophile? Looks to me a lot like a protonated ketone, huh? And that's how it's going to react. It's a strong nucleophile. Isn't that cool? And so it's ready to go. It can uh, react even with a weak nucleophile. Did I say nucleophile? Goodness. It's a strong electrophile. Sorry. It's electron loving. And so it'll react even with a weak nucleophile, electrophile. So what's our weak nucleophile going to react with? I want another ethanol on there, so that's what it's going to react with. The ethanol is, once again, a weak nucleophile, but that's OK, because we have a strong electrophile. And so I'm at my add set point in the mechanism. Add, pet P, I'm in the E, or I'm in the A, <laughs> ah. And at this point, it'll temporarily, oh no, it won't be a stereo center because the rings. Almost tricked myself. The protonated ethanol, the protonated ethanol, and the ethanol are different, but the ring is the same around. So there's no stereocenter in this guy. So we're almost there. <clears throat> what do we need to do to get to the final ketal? Uh, we just need to deprotonate this. That's what the D is. So what's going to be our base? 
the proton shuttle once again, the ethanol. Pretty cool, huh? And you can see the, the way I think of this is the ethanol, protonated ethanol, proton shuttle thing. I think of that as the, like, the true catalyst of the reaction. I think of this, the toxic acid as sort of just like the initiator. And then, because it's not regenerated, but the protonated ethanol is used up and regenerated throughout the whole mechanism. Oh, and that last step is the uh, deprotonation as the pad. Peed. So pretty cool, huh? That's a uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight step mechanism. And I'm, I bet you practice it a little bit, you're going to be super confident with it. And it's pretty neat. After you draw it out a couple times, you won't even need this. This is like more of a check because you'll be more savvy. I think you, a lot of you already are pretty savvy with mechanisms. Thinking like, oh, weak nucleophile, let's make it strong. Let's add, let's proton transfers and all that. I headed back over to the mechanism database and we got a nice one. I really like this one. This one's by Ginny Virginia Johnson back a few years ago. And uh, she drew up the pad, pad peed mechanism and she made a cool artistic theme to it. So she's got the acetal synthesis. She's got the frog. And cause I think of the pad peed mechanism makes me think of lily pads. So I was like, we should make it frog themed. She's got the frog there with the bug on his tongue and pad peed. And she's doing an acetal. She started with an aldehyde and ethanol, similar to what we did, huh? You can see she's got the, pr pr the protonation because the solvent gets protonated before you even add the aldehyde. And then you make the weak electrophile a strong electrophile. You add, deprotonate, protonate, remove water when it's formed, blah, blah, blah. So uh, you could check that out in our mechanism database. I want you to definitely be good at this mechanism, this pad peed stuff. So I'm going to do another example and uh, you'll for sure get this stuff on exam three and the final most likely too. So let's go about this. We start with uh, an aldehyde in this case. And uh, the aldehyde is going to be turned into its acetal. You can tell it's an acetal. Acetal, the way you find acetals, ketals, is look for a carbon that has two oxygens attached to it. So the oxygens are both on the exact same carbon, then you're thinking acetal. Especially, it, it, oxygens also have to have sp3 carbons attached to them. Um, okay, this one's an interesting one. It's different than the last one because I've got a diol. Not, not just two ethanols, but one molecule with two alcohols on it. This is a diol. This one's a 1,2 diol. Because you can see like one carbon one, carbon two, one, two diol, right? I still have toxic acid. I'm removing water. It's an acidic mechanism again. I'll be high. All right, so let's do the mechanism. We start off with our Aldehyde. Is the aldehyde a weak or a strong electrophile? It is a, a weak electrophile. It's going to need to be protonated. But I forgot. I want to first do it again. I want to protonate the solvent first. Let's imagine we're using this as the solvent, the diol. And it will react with the toxic acid, start us off with our protonation of the pad P. It's kind of weird to see the diol in this, but you'll, it'll, it'll make sense. So we got our first protonation, right? There we go. Toxic acids. Done. Early day. Toxic acid shows up at 10.30 every day and is out by 11. Uh, 
AM, AM. So we've got our to uh, toss just down there. Now this is going to be our true catalyst. It's going to protonate the aldehyde to make it a strong electrophile because it's weak right now. You know what? We want to be super specific. I'm going to be super specific, but you can skip it if you want. I'm going to wiggle this guy. Whoa, what's going on? But if you look at this, this is similar to an alkene. So this hydrogen can be on the right or the left. The lone pair of hydrogen can switch places. So that's kind of fun, right? And oh, what kind of step was that? We started off with a protonation. We got a second for protonation. So that's poop, poop. And now this guy is a strong electrophile. And this is a weak Nucleophile, they can react. And I, so I got my first addition step. So I got my p -p And on this one, I will create a stereo center. So I'm going to wiggle that guy. On the last one with the five-membered ring, it was symmetric. Okay, uh, now I want to get this oxygen onto the carbon as well. I need both of them, uh, but I have this alcohol. I, it, I need to get rid of that guy. That alcohol is a good or a bad leaving group? Bad leaving group, bad. And then this one right now, as of now, this is a good leaving group, huh? But I want it to stay, so I have to deal with that. So right now it's a good leaving group, but I don't want it to be good. Goody goody two shoes must be something inside. So I need to take care of that guy. I'm going to take care of it by deprotonating it with my dial again. My diol is acting as a proton shuttle, huh? It's going to come along and deprotonate that good leaving group so it's no longer a good leaving group. So I've got my p pad. Got my lily pad. you guys are liking this stuff. I kind of like it. It's pretty amazing how far you've come to be able to draw a mechanism like this. Okay, so there we go. We still have bad leaving groups though, huh? Both are bad leaving groups. But I want that alcohol to be a good leaving group. So I'm going to protonate that. I'm going to bring this over to the other board, up top there. Oh, this was a protonation. So I've done my pad and now I'm starting my peed. Okay, here we go. I'm going to leave off that. Eh. No, I'll keep it for now. Now my alcohol is a good leaving group. And my proton shuttle is back to just being a regular little diol again. Okay, so I've got a good leaving group. And when you have a good leaving group, if you have another atom attached to the carbon with the leaving group that has a lone pair, you're set up for what kind of step? Push, pull. So here's my elimination step. 
which is also referred to as a push-pull mechanism. Because the lone pair on the oxygen is pushing the water off, and the water with this plus charge is pulling electrons towards it to come off. And... Uh, this guy. And then when the water comes off, we'll remove it. Drive the equilibrium towards the acetal side. Okay, so once once again we're here. What does this look like? This carbonyl with the plus charge on it looks like a strong electrophile, huh? We got a strong electrophile right there. And now in solution we have these strong, we have these weak nucleophiles like the solvent here, right? But we also have a nucleophile that's already attached to the molecule. So who's going to win out on this situation? It turns out this weak nucleophile, the one that's already attached, will be the winner. So when you have diols, that guy wins. It, we say it has a chelation effect. Uh, I think that's the term. Because it's a it's an intramolecular reaction, intra, I, uh, I N T R A. It's intramolecular. With this one, if this is going to add into the carbonyl, that'd be intermolecular. So intermolecular reactions are usually slower because the two molecules have to collide together in order to react where intra can be faster because they're already attached. They don't have, they're like, just, just swings over like so. Let's see, boom, I'll just go there. And it can add on. This is a, like a bidentate ligand, sort of like the intro where we had the EDTA was a hexadentate ligand. That can hold on to metals really good because all of its six holding things are on the, from the same molecule. Go. So that was an addition. I know I didn't add a separate molecule, but I did add to the carbonyl. And initially, when it adds, it is still a stair center, so I'm going to wiggle that one. And we're almost there. We did our p pad p e a just depertinate. <clears throat> and so our proton shuttle can come by. No longer a stair center now. And I regenerate my what I call my true catalyst. And I have my acetal in that last deprotonation, the pad P. You might be asking why are we spending so much time on these acetals and ketals and stuff? Well, they're actually very important in chemistry and biology. For instance, here's the uh, Fischer projection of glucose. And glucose can cyclize to make uh, these two six-membered rings. So you'll see the way it works is this, this website's showing this, uh, the Fisher projection kind of curled on itself first. So alcohol 5 could react with the aldehyde. So here's alcohol 5 to the aldehyde, carbon 1, that would make a six-membered ring. And when it comes in and it adds to that aldehyde, it can add from our side or the other side. So this carbon one, you get both R and S stereochemistry. If it adds to carbon one in a way that the alcohol is opposite of this primary alcohol here, then we call it the alpha 
glucopyranose if it adds in a way that the alcohol and that's from the what we call the anomeric carbon, the one that, that was the aldehyde. If it adds where that alcohol is up, the same way as the primary alcohol, they both be up. That's the beta sugar. So you probably heard of alpha and beta sugars. And uh, they are both actually not acetals because acetals have to have a carbon with two oxygens. And then the oxygens need a carbon. So this car this oxygen has a carbon, but this other oxygen has a hydrogen. So it's it's only like halfway to an acetal. So if you look back at our mechanism, you see we had an intermediate like this where we, we had a bad leaving group alcohol. We protonated and push pulled it off and then we added another alcohol. So this is called a hemiacetal. It's like halfway to acetal. And this is a hemiacetal too, but it's related to what we're doing, right? And when uh, these uh, single sugars, these monosaccharides, when they bond, bond together, they can create acetals and full, uh, full acetals, not just hemiacetals. So for example, here's maltose. You probably heard of maltose. And this carbon has two oxygens attached to it. So it's an acetal because it has a hydrogen off of it, not a, another carbon. It's, not, it's from an aldehyde. So we have an acetal linkage there. And then this is not an acetal. That one's just a, an alcohol. So there it is. We've got maltose has an acetal linkage. And fructose, this is table sugar. This is the sugar you add to your cookies and your, your baking and things. It has a carbon here with an oxygen to another carbon and another oxygen to another carbon. So that there is an acetal as well. And down here we even have another acetal. So they're both acetals. This is a glucose and that's, wait a minute. This isn't, this is sucrose. This is not fructose. Oh, they're saying the fructose is non-reducing? Oh, for, for, ignore this. That's glucose, this is fructose, together they're sucrose. Um, this is two glucoses together making a maltose. But yeah, so biochemistry and sugar chemistry has a lot of acetals and ketals. And another thing is uh, that we'll, that we won't deal with that as much, but we'll do this a lot. So we learned how to do the mechanism to make uh, acetals, oh, and I even got it here, hemiacetals, like halfway. I'll, I'll, I'll explain that a little more in the next example. So uh, we learned how to make acetals with the papad peed forward mechanism, but you can reverse it too. If you remember, all those equilibrium arrows, arrows were, uh, were all the arrows between reactants and products were equilibrium, so they're all reversible. And if you reverse it, it's a papid ped. We'll look at that. And so you can... Take a carbonyl, ketone or aldehyde, make it into an acetal, and then you can reverse, take it away. Um, why is that useful? Because the acetals are actually protecting groups for carbonyls. You can protect now a ketone or an aldehyde by making it into an acetal or ketal. And once you make them, they're very stable to strong basic conditions like they can survive no problem in hydroxide, even Grignards and organolithiums, alkyne anions, hydrides. They're very stable to a lot of things. So let's actually do an example of a synthesis where we use them as a protecting group. Now we'll do a retrosynthesis that's going to need uh, the acetal protecting group. You see in this synthesis, I have a carbonyl here um, that doesn't seem to have reacted with the Maybe this is made into a bromide, then a Grignard or lithium. And it's gonna, I wanted to add it here, but that's an alcohol. Maybe uh, if I oxidize that with PCC to the aldehyde, could I just add the Grignard there? No, it'll add to both. So I have to protect this guy, the ketone, then make the aldehyde carry it out. So let me do the retro first. The retros are a little bit tricky, remember, with protecting groups. It's been a little while since we had protecting groups. Remember we used them for alcohols before. Now we'll get to use them for um, ketones and aldehydes. This will be our last protecting group. We could do more protecting groups. We'll see. Um, so I'm going to say this comes from <clears throat> the protected ketones as the last step in the synthesis. I like this protecting group. It looks sort of like Bart Simpson to me. I don't know why. Like those are his eyes and his hair.
So once I get to that point, I can say, oh yeah, I have an alcohol. Oh. Disconnect. Right here. And that was an aldehyde that the, uh, say, Grignard added to. And our ketone was protected. I like to use this protecting group, uh, this acetal too, because it, it's got a higher yield to form, because once one of the alcohols comes on, the other one's attached. It has the chelation effect that we were talking about. And then you'll see in the literature that's used a lot. Okay, so we got that, and then uh, this can come, of course, from the, uh, the bromide, which can come from just the benzene. Easy, easy. Uh, now, this would come from the actual alcohol that we started with, and the ketone being protected. Bart there still, and that then of course came from your your alcohol, your, your alpha hydroxy ketone. This is an actual interesting functional group. If you you might have heard of alpha hydroxy ketones. So here's our ketone with our aldehyde with our carbonyl. That's alpha, that's the alpha carbon next door. So this is an alpha hydroxy ketone. They are um, in like skincare products and things. Not this exact one, but alpha hydroxy. Alpha hydroxy acids as well. Maybe not alpha, alpha hydroxy ketones. Yeah, whatever. All right, so now let's do the synthesis. So we start off with our ketone and we protect it. So I add my One, two, ethane diol, tosic acid, remove water, and that will protect my ketone. You might be asking yourself, wait a minute, why won't the alcohol here just add in? It would be kind of a tight ring if it were, say I had this going on, I have that as a good leaving group, and then my alcohol reacting with itself, it's kind of an epoxide type of thing. That's gonna look a little tight. But then you might also say, oh, what about just another ketone adding into here? Well, that might happen, but these guys have a big advantage in that once one of them gets on there, the other one's attached, it swings around. So this should be good yielding. And uh, now I need to oxidize that and I'll use PCC because I don't want that to get oxidized any more than one step. Uh, I couldn't use MnO2, our new uh, oxidizing conditions because this isn't, is not allylic. And Jones oxidation would oxidize all the way to the carboxylic acid. But PCC will work and I'll make my aldehyde, and I'll pause right there, and I have to come over it and make my organometallic, my Grignard, so I can add bromine, iron three bromide, that's our new, that's in our toolbox now, huh? Brominate and benzene, no problem anymore. And then we add magnesium metal, like you did in lab, back in the old days when lab was actually in a lab, not in your bedroom on the computer. And uh, now we're almost there. We can add our protected ketone aldehyde. And when we do, the protected ketone ketal here is very stable under these highly basic conditions, it's fine. So just the aldehyde will react. Acidic workup. And we'll get How did I draw that? I think I drew it like this, huh? 
benzene ring there, alcohol here. Okay, so I'm almost done. And now we haven't actually formally written this mechanism or this reaction out. We'll actually do the mechanism. So if I add, uh, how do I remove this guy? Well, I do the similar thing I did to put it on. I have the alcohol, acid, and removed water. Now, instead, I'm gonna add water. Removing water helps drive you towards the acetyl product side. Adding water will drive you back towards the ketone side. And we'll use toxic acid again. And we won't add the alcohol, because that's coming off. And this will deprotect the ketone, so I'll get my ketone back. And the rest of it stays the same. Pretty cool, huh? Now let's uh, let's do this mechanism. I said we should know how to do the backwards um, acetal deprotection. Let's do it. Let's become experts at this stuff. Okay, so. What happens with water and toxic acid? The water gets protonated first. Whoa. So I have protonation first. Oh, let's let's keep track of what this is gonna, the mnemonic for this will be. It starts with a P. And then um, now my protonated water, my hydroniums, my true acid catalyst in this reaction. Caustic acid's done, it's going fishing. All right, I need this guy to come off. Is that a good leaving group right there? Or is this a good leaving group? No, they're both bad leaving groups. Bad leaving group, bad. But I can make them good, I can protonate. I'm under acidic conditions, I like protonating things, I like positive, I like positive charge organic intermediates. So I've got another protonation step. Now I've got a good leaving group on this side. Good leaving group. I'm gonna abbreviate the, uh, the benzene ring as pH phenyl. And the water was made as well. Okay, and then uh, I've got a good leaving group there and a lone pair right there. So what's gonna happen? Good leaving group. It's gonna be a push-pull mechanism, huh? Elimination. Push. Pull mechanism. Okay, so now I'm over here. Uh, oh, you know what? I should have wiggled this when it first got protonated. It's a stair center at that point, huh? Basically, a strong electrophile here, huh? And I have that diol still attached, but eventually I want to get rid of the diol, huh? I want that thing to come off. So, how's that going to happen? How can I get just an oxygen here and lose that guy? Is there anything in the solution that can provide me with maybe only adding an oxygen to this? Yeah, I've got a strong electrophile and now water is gonna be my weak nucleophile that's gonna add in there. So I get an addition. So let's go back. I haven't been filling in my mnemonic. I don't think we need it really, but let's see what it's spelled out anyways. P-P-E-A. P-P-E-A. P-P. -E There we go. 
go. And now I want to keep that water on, right? Oh, not the whole water, but I want the oxygen from this water. And it's currently a good leaving group. And this is a bad leaving group. So what do I need to do? I need a proton shuttle. And what's that going to be? That's going to be the solvent water. So water's going to come along and deprotonate the good leaving group because I want that oxygen to stay on there. So now I've got my next step is deprotonate a peed. Now that's not such a good leaving group. My proton shuttle water is protonated. I want that to be a good leaving group. So I'll protonate it. And I need to go back over to the other board again. Whew, here's a long time. Okay, so what's up next? I've got a good leaving group on the thing that I want to leave. And uh, I've got a lone pair here, so what kind of step is this? It's an elimination and a special one. It's the push-pull, huh? I'll be super specific, I'll wiggle this hydrogen and see our uh, diol is off. We're almost there, believe it or not. Uh, now I just need to deprotonate it, huh? And what's going to deprotonate it? And what's this going to be called? The pad head, huh? going to need water to deprotonate it. And we got it. Ketones back. And that phenyl ring was added. So now we know how to <coughs> protect and deprotect ketones and aldehydes with the uh, acetals.